you must go looking for more information. You must uh, uh, keep searching for, because that's what Miss Simpkins was. You know, she just was a, a learner, a, a every day, what can I learn? What more do I need to learn? And so I just, I teach this everywhere I go to anybody who will listen, captive audiences count, um, that you must stay hungry for all the information that you have gotten and even the information that you don't know just yet. And that brother just before us was also talking about, right? The learning, the lifelong learning that must happen when you are an activist because uh, there's so much that has been kept from us. All right. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Uh, again, welcome back to the Jessica Simpkins School of Human Rights. Uh, that was, of course, Nikki Finney, a world-renowned poet and a daughter of South Carolina. Um, she is a professor of, um, of writing and poetry at the University of South Carolina, and she's the daughter, daughter of Ernest Finney. Um, and she actually gave that talk to our Jessica School group, I believe that was before the pandemic. Yeah, uh, well, I think that was the year of the pandemic, 2020. Oh, wow. Uh, I know it all blurs together now, um, but uh, Dr. Finney, who, by the way, we need to get her to do the class at some point, still owes us uh, a year of, of class taking after those remarks, but uh, that was a way for us to introduce tonight's class, and we're excited to have you all here tonight, either in person or virtually, and this evening, of course, we have a special guest, Justine Hill Edwards, who I'll introduce in a moment. But tonight, we're going to actually start the Modesto School class by taking care of some housekeeping items and also having a few folks from Zoom land introduce themselves as well. We promised through that last week, we ran out of time. So we're going to get to that those two tasks this evening. So uh, first, we're going to have Becky Robbins to introduce us with some of the housekeeping items that we should all keep in mind for the duration of the semester. Becky? So basically, what I wanted to just make sure that everybody knew about the website so that um, that they know where everything is that they need for this session. Um, and, and I invite you to come back at your when you have some time to just poke around because it's got some pretty neat archives, including that clip of Nikki Finney and it's you can watch the whole thing. It's really, really inspiring. Um, and there's other really there's other stuff there that you might find interesting, including. So, Chris, if you could just pull what I'm most interested in sharing with y'all is the um, the spring session. So make sure that you book, bookmark MajeskaSchool.com and you can find this stuff fairly easily. It's pretty intuitive. So um, under spring session, you can find the class calendar, click on that. So that has got a, a list of the, the classes, a, a truncated version of the calendar. Um, and you might wanna keep checking back on that because the deeper dives will be added as the, the session progresses, but we'll also be sending you emails, but it's good to know that that stuff is also listed here um, at the same time. Um, you can find the study guides. If you click over, go, Chris, if you go to class calendar and go to the right, you can click on the, the, um, the readings for that, the session. So those are the readings for class two, it's password protected. They're all the same password. It's MOD school, MOD school. So that should get you any of the readings. Um, just call us if you have any problems, but you shouldn't have any. Um, the class three will be posted tomorrow. Um, and um, we're in the process of updating the other readings. And lastly, the, the class recordings are down there that I think um, they're posted every after every class so in case you miss one or want to revisit something you can go back and reference those. Um, and lastly, I would ask you to um, look at the donate button, which is that nice shiny red button there on the webpage, which will take you to, not you, what I'm saying is if you have friends with deep pockets, send them to um, the website so they can check it out. And um, especially if they care about education, they might be moved to make a donation um, that helps us uh, provide stipends for guest speakers and um, scholarships. All right. Thank you so much, Becky, for that, those housekeeping items. Again, those are really important. Make sure you bookmark the Medicine School website as soon as you can. I have put a, a link to it in the chat as well. What we're going to do right now is we're going to have five folks from Zoom briefly, and I do emphasize briefly <laughs> introduce themselves. So please give us your name, uh, where you're Zooming in from, and Tell us a little bit about why you're taking the Majesta School this year. So when I choose you, uh, please turn your camera on if possible. 
and make sure you also unmute yourself as well. So um, now the deep dives, I think most of those will likely be recorded, uh, but again, keep your eyes out for those too. Um, they, okay. they are, Robert. The, okay. Dr. Gallman had a deeper dive last night and that's posted there as well. Okay, excellent, thank you. All right, so let's go ahead to those introductions. The first person I will choose is Della Clark. Della Clark, please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Della Clark from Chester High, from Chester, South Carolina. I'm a social studies teacher at Chester High School, and I just wanted to grow my knowledge. That's why I'm taking the course. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Della. All right, up next is Tradessa Smalls. <coughs> Hi, I'm Tradessa. I live in Greenville, South Carolina, but I am from Burgess, South Carolina, which is a little outside of Myrtle Beach. I took this course to grow my knowledge and also to learn more about Black history, um, especially in South Carolina, things that I wasn't taught in school, so I wanted to know more. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tradessa. All right, two down, three to go. Uh, Mary Joyce Carlson, please introduce yourself. Good evening. I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with my uh, computer. Um, I'm Mary Joyce Carlson. I'm uh, Zooming in from Washington, DC. And I wanted to uh, join this course because uh, I am working with a new labor union uh, that the United Southern Service Workers Union that is going to focus its organizing among low wage workers in North and South Carolina. And um, I have some familiarity with the civil rights history in South Carolina, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to learn more about it to help inform our work. Excellent, thank you so much for that. All right, up next is um, Janan Jackson. Hi, my name is Janan Jackson. I am from um, Beaufort County School District. Oh, yeah, can't see me. All right. Um, Kelly Elementary School, and I'm here to learn as much as I can learn. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Okay, and our fifth person um, will be uh, Bane Louisa. Please introduce yourself. Hi, all. Can you all? I hope y'all can hear me. Um, I'm Bane. I um, am based out of Greenville, South Carolina, and I am also, funnily enough, with USSW. Um, I'm a digital organizer, and I actually have a few of my colleagues here with me. So I'm excited to learn a bit more about South Carolina history. I was raised in South Carolina, and um, although I've been part of the social justice movement for several years. I haven't um, learned in depth how all of our struggles have impacted South Carolina and the communities that have struggled here. So I'm excited to learn more about that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And again, I think those five individuals were a good cross section of what the Majesca School is all about. We have folks in South Carolina, folks from Washington, D.C., folks who are educators, folks who are activists, folks who are involved in unions. That gives us a good sense of how the Majesca School means many different things to many different folks across the state and across the country. And of course, in the weeks to come, we'll be introducing additional folks who are coming in via Zoom. So be warned. Uh, we'll get you sooner or later. All right, so with that being said, uh, we are going to now transition into the meat of tonight's discussion. We're going to start with our special guest this evening, Dr. Justine Hill Edwards of the University of Virginia. Um, Dr. Hill Edwards, of course, is a, an acclaimed scholar, and we've actually invited her this evening to talk a bit about the work from her first book. Now, Dr. Hill Edwards um, is actually a specialist in the history of slavery and capitalism. Um, she has actually worked on this idea of how capitalism and slavery really go hand in hand in U.S. and global history. Her first book, Unfree Markets, Slaves Economy and the Rise of Capitalism in South Carolina, 
is the book from which the excerpt that's posted on our website comes from. Um, her research reveals the development of market capitalism primarily in South Carolina during its colonial period through slavery in what would become known as the Palmetto State as a means of controlling both the market and the enslaved. So uh, Dr. Edwards will be talking a bit more about her book, about the topic of slavery and capitalism, and how the state of South Carolina is so important to the histories of both. So without further ado, please give Justine Hill Edwards a wonderful round of applause. Thank you, thank you. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me clearly. Um, I'm excited to be speaking to the Majeska School again this, this year on a topic that um, really excites me and continues to propel my research and my teaching, especially in African-American history. So I am excited about uh, the conversation that we'll have about, I think, a really important topic, which interestingly, and I'll talk about this towards the, the end, kind of transcends the history of slavery. And we can, I think, in, in interesting ways, apply it to our current moment when we talk about topics such as the racial wealth gap and wealth inequality in America. So I am excited to share a little bit of my research, and, but broadly I, ideas on this, the intersection between capitalism and slavery. Um, okay, let's do this. Making sure the screen is sharing. Thumbs up that we're good. Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. I'm gonna move this right here. Um, so first, of course, many thanks to the staff at the Majeska Sim Simkin School, um, especially Brett Bercy and Professor Green for inviting me again to dig into the history of slavery and how it intersects with the history of capitalism in the United States. Um, but particularly in a state that has captured my attention and that I think to really understand this fuller landscape of how capitalism and slavery evolved in tandem, uh, we really have to look at the history of South Carolina to understand those connections. And so I am, again, excited to talk about this topic this evening. Um, and so through looking at a variety of records that I did for uh, my first book on free markets, um, we can see that there was a dynamic relationship between slavery and the evolution of capitalism in South Carolina. Um, this was particularly true if we look at the experiences of enslaved men and women. And so while the archival record shows that South Carolina evolved from a slave hold, holding colony to a slave holding state, it also became a breeding ground for the types of economic in enterprises that we would actually associate with modern capitalism from the rise of rice cultivation, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, or what we call South Carolina gold or Carolina gold, um, to the cultivation of long staple and then short staple cotton. And all of this backbreaking work done primarily by enslaved African men and women and then enslaved men and women of African descent, um, we see that all of this economic activity began from the moment that the colony of Carolina was founded in 1670. So that's gonna be my focus for this evening, really connecting the histories of slavery and the histories of capitalism in South Carolina, um, tracing it from its colonial roots to the period right after this civil war and re reconstruction. The focus of my current research is actually on the period of reconstruction. So I would be a bit remiss to not integrate a broader conversation about how these regimes, these exploitative economic regimes that really shaped slavery and capitalism continued even after slavery's legal end in 1865. So with that, Let's start. Nope. There we go. Okay. So the economy of slavery began in South Carolina, again, from the moment that it was founded in 1670. So South Carolina is interesting for a variety of reasons. First, because it was founded as the first slaveholding colony 
in the colonies and then states that would become the United States. And so interestingly enough, if we think about the foundations of slavery as a regime, slavery as an institution that shaped social, that shaped legal, that shaped economic interactions, then South Carolina is the place that we really have to look at and understand to really understand those roots. And so that's first. So second, South Carolina is important in this conversation about slavery and the rise of capitalism and how they became intertwined and grew together was because it was, of course, the first state to secede from the Union after Lincoln's election as president in 1860. And so in many ways, South Carolina was in the vanguard, was really at the forefront of many of the conversations that historians, but uh, uh, scholars kind of broadly talk about the ways in which slavery and capitalism kind of evolved and developed together. And so to understand one, you have to understand the other and vice versa. And so if we look at the early history of Carolina, as it was called, as a colony, it is clear that in this history, both slavery and emerging forms of capitalism were kind of at the foundation of the colony's founding. And you'll see in this, this map here, um, Carolina, South Carolina as we know it, was really positioned in this place, not just in mainland North, North America or, or the British colonies, but in the Atlantic world. And in a few minutes, we'll talk a little bit about why. And so to do that, to understand the colonial origins of slavery and capitalism in South Carolina, we actually can't start in mainland North America. We can't start in South Carolina. We have to go to the Caribbean. We have to go to the West Indies to Bar Barbados. And so the connections between Barbados and South Carolina run deep. In 1627, a small group of white English colonists with an even smaller group of enslaved Africans colonized what would be known as Barbados. After less than 20 years, Barbados became one of England's most populous colonies in the West Indies with approximately 30,000 mostly white indentured servants laboring on the island colony. But by uh, 1640s, Barbadian planters began to experiment with sugarcane cultivation. They were essentially trying to figure out what was this product, what was this crop that could make this colony uh, productive, that could make this colony and this colonial enterprise profitable. Uh, so this product, sugar, proved to be an amazing financial success. Uh, with the rise of sugar cultivation came the need expressed by wealthy planters, wealthy enslavers, for steadier sources of labor. So sugar planters came to rely more and more in the 1650s and 1660s on enslaved Africans as laborers and as commodities, as, as property, because they had a hard time actually recruiting white indentured servants to work in these incredibly difficult, incredibly violent conditions. Um, sugar cultivation is known in this period of time in the Atlantic world as being highly profitable, but it required a huge investment of both capital and of both labor. And so white indentured servants weren't really being lured by the, the allure of working and ultimately dying in these incredibly violent conditions. And so in English traders started to kind of tap into this very vibrant trade in enslaved African labor from the Atlantic African coast, negotiating with Atlantic African rulers and elites to tap into labor sources. And we're talking about, again, human laborers. And so uh, by the 1660s, the demographics of Barbados began to shift and shifted quite uh, quickly to approximately 27,000 enslaved Africans and 26,000 white colonists. And so Barbados very quickly became uh, majority Black and majority enslaved. And so the combination of this population increase, especially of enslaved African laborers and the massive amounts of capital that investors and enslavers were making in uh, making profits from sugar cultivation meant that there were dramatic consequences. The introduction of, again, capital investment 
encouraged enslavers and plantation holders to buy as much land and buy as many enslaved Africans as possible. And so this also meant that because Barbados, again, was an island colony, that there was limited space. And so enterprising investors essentially being pushed out of being able to invest in both sugar cultivation and enslaved labor in Bar uh, Barbados started seeking other regions where they could make a longer term investment. And so eight Lord proprietors known as the Goose Creek men acquired land grants from King Charles II in 1663 to essentially transplant the Barbadian model, which had by this time, at least economically, become very, very successful. They were seeking to transplant this, this model of sugar cultivation and enslaved African labor to British holdings in mainland North America especially this region between Virginia and Spanish Florida. And so these eight Lord proprietors called the newly established colony, again, south of Virginia and north of Spanish Florida, they called it Carolina. And soon there, thereafter, it split off. But uh, this region right here between uh, North Carolina and Spanish Florida was essentially called Carolina. And so, in 1670, Carolina was founded. And again, it was founded not as a refuge for, uh, from uh, religious and political prosecution, such as Massachusetts. It was not founded as kind of a beacon of, of, of li uh, liberty and freedom. Carolina, South Carolina, was founded as a slave colony. It was founded so that those eight Lord proprietors could profit from the investments that they were making in plantations and in enslaved laborers. And so these enslavers created a colony where they were fully supportive of, fully embracing, and also fully invested in the success and the profitability of slavery. And this lasted almost two centuries and in many forms. Um, and white South Carolinians were essentially at the forefront of, of being pro-slavery advocates during this period of time. And so on the other hand, it was enslaved Africans transported from, from Barbados and regions of Atlantic Africa, who on the other hand started to kind of introduce their ideas about culture, about life and about economic activity to the colony. And that is to say that in the colonial period in particular, enslaved men and women brought with them their own ideas of not just how to labor, how to work, but actually how to engage in the economic lives of the communities in which they lived and the communities in which they were enslaved. And so enslaved men and women worked the plantations growing a product that had become incredibly uh, profitable, and that was rice and indigo in the South Carolina Low Country. And they started uh, kind of slowly to in introduce their own ideas of labor organization and how kind of working writ large fit into their lives. And again, their, their lives that were completely structured by exploitation. And so the tens of thousands of enslaved Africans were contributing directly to the growing Carolina economy of, again, uh, rice and then indigo in the 17th and increasingly in the 18th centuries. And so if we look at this advertisement, I think it's a fascinating one. We can begin to, I think, more clearly understand the relationship between slavery, capitalism, and the growth of the colonial economy in South Carolina. Um, and so again, I think that this is a fascinating uh, a kind of rep a representation of kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about slavery and the growth of the Carolina rice economy. It says to be sold on board the ship um, Vance Island on Tuesday, the 6th of May next. Um, a choice cargo of about 250 fine, healthy Negroes just arrived from the Windward and Rice Coast. And so the Windward Coast is modern day Ghana, and the Rice Coast is modern day Senegal and Gambia. Um, the utmost care has already been taken and shall be continued to keep them free 
from the least danger of being infected with the smallpox. No boat having been on board and all other communication with people from Charlestown prevented. Um, and so I think that this, again, is a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating ad. Um, it comes from the South Carolina Gazette from 1670. And essentially, the slave traders placing this ad were telling potential buyers that, um, that there are 250 healthy enslaved men, women, and probably children. And they just arrived actually from regions of Atlantic Africa that had by the, by the 1760s had come to be known for their kind of proficiency in rice cultivation knowledge. They had kind of, uh, kind of special cultural knowledge of how to grow rice. And so the utmost care had already been taken and Shabi continued to keep them free from being infected with smallpox. Um, smallpox was um, known in this period of time to be a deadly disease. And so these slave traders were essentially communicating to buyers that um, the enslaved men, women, and children on board this ship were free of smallpox. Whether that was true or not remained to be seen. But again, we're talking about the, um, the commercial activity of slavery re really being encapsulated in this piece, in this ad that I think is um, just fascinating and devastating at the same time. Um, the thousands of enslaved Africans that were kidnapped, sold, shackled, and bought from the Rice Coast and from the windward coast of Atlantic Africa um, across the Atlantic to the South Carolina Low Country. Again, they brought with them very distinct and clear ideas about slavery, about their relationships to one another, their kinship ties. Um, but interestingly enough, also distinct ideas about rice cultivation. And so uh, one of the very distinct ideas that in increasingly enslaved Africans, especially from the Senegal and Gambia regions of At Atlantic Africa was their ideas about how to grow and cultivate rice. And so by 1700, most of the thousands of enslaved Africans who were in the low country, who were enslaved in the low country worked by and large on rice plantations. Um, and rice cultivation was a very laborious process. Um, it was essentially a year long process and rice ultimately comprised between one half to two thirds of all South Carolina exports in the 18th century. And so this means that rice was the major export of South Carolina and in particular, the regions in and around Charleston. And that enslaved Africans, therefore, were primarily responsible for contributing forcefully their labor to the economic growth of this very important British colony uh, in the 18th century, at least until um, the end of the American Revolution. Um, and so as tobacco came to be associated with places like Virginia, where I am, in Maryland, Delaware, uh, rice came to really define um, the Carolina Low Country in this period. Um, and so uh, rice cultivation and slavery became intimately connected, intimately intertwined, which meant that enslaved labor, rice cultivation, and the profitability of rice cultivation and the rice e economy were tightly linked. They were in interconnected. Um, and again, rice planting was a laborious, a slow process that required particular knowledge and training. It required knowledge of planting techniques, irrigation techniques, weeding, harvesting, and all of this was done by and large by enslaved Africans. And so in a departure from um, a particular system of labor organization that existed in, again, places like uh, Maryland and Virginia. Um, in the Carolina Low Country, uh, enslaved Africans were organizing themselves in a very particular way to not just grow and cultivate rice, but to find ways to carve out their own spaces for autonomy, 
um, in this very exploitative labor regime. And so enslaved African labor was organized via what we call the task system. And under the task system, enslaved men and women were essentially assigned a certain amount of work for the day or week based on a variety of factors, um, their age, their gender, the time of year, their physical abilities, and the kind of requirements of the kind of rice growing and harvesting season. And this type of labor, unlike what we see kind of the traditional landscape of slavery with the enslaved working in fields and an overseer traditionally white kind of mandating that they, they work, this labor was, was essentially kind of self-organized. And so that meant that the enslaved um, were not under the direct supervision of an overseer. Um, and so this was kind of a, a double-edged sword, so to speak. It meant that enslaved men and women had more uh, autonomy, but it also meant that they were kind of exploited in a diff different way because of just the rigor of rice cultivation. It meant that their lives were kind of structured by this very exploitative labor regime. And so again, this does not mean that just because they could by and large control or have more autonomy without white oversight, it didn't mean that the work was not backbreaking and oppressive and exploitative because it was. It just meant that enslaved men and women were perhaps figuring out how to carve out spaces of autonomy for themselves away from white oversight, away from the presence of a white overseer and most certainly away from the president of the presence, excuse me, of their enslavers. And so um, all of this was happening in the 18th century and their labor continued to enrich investors and enslavers who were investing massive amounts of capital in the success and in the profitability of slavery and enslaved labor. And so all of this again means that the economy of rice cultivation and of slavery um, meant that South Carolina began to rise as one of the wealthiest colonies in British mainland North America um, as a result of, again, the influx of enslaved Africans and the production of rice. And so all of this meant that with the founding of the colony of Carolina in 1670, um, we see a massive growth of the enslaved population. And so uh, in 1670, there were about um, recorded 30 enslaved Africans who, uh, who were in Carolina with the founding of the, the colony. And they, they comprised about 15% of the population. If we go down this, this, this list, we see the numbers continue to steadily rise. And so by 1690, the, um, the number rose to about 1,500, uh, which comprised about 38% of the colony's population. And by the 1720s, South Carolina had what the great South Carolina historian Peter Wood called a Black majority. So by 1720, 70.3% um, of the South Carolina population were considered Black, and the majority of that population were enslaved. And so we can kind of see how, um, in many ways, it may not there, therefore be surprising that South Carolina would quickly catapult to the top of kind of economic dominance in colonial America, not just because of the kind of sheer majority of the Black population, but the ways in which their labor contributed to the bolstering of the South Carolina and therefore the colonial American economy. And we, we see the population kind of start to taper off just as a percentage of the whole population, but um, we are continuing to see, you know, 66%, 60%, um, towards the tail end of the American Rev Revolution, we see the number proportionately dip, um, but we are still talking about a majority of the population in South Carolina by 1720 being enslaved and disproportionately enslaved African. <laughs> 
And so interestingly, with regard to the kind of introduction and cultivation of rice in the South Carolina low country, there has been some debate about the origins of low country rice cultivation. Um, some historians believe that the spread of rice happened as a result of enslaved Africans importing their knowledge of rice cult, uh, cultivation with them, right? They were bringing their cultural inheritance, a cultural knowledge of how to grow and successfully cultivate this very important product. Um, historians such as Judith Carney, for example, in her stellar outstanding book, Black Rice, I think convincingly makes this, this claim. And not just enslaved Africans, but enslaved African women importing this knowledge and introducing it to the ways in which um, enslavers, again, were profiting from, um, from rice cult uh, cultivation and enslaved labor. Um, there are other historians who believe that it was the European production of these techniques that can be, um, that can kind of claim su success economically of South Carolina. But I think that there is some, something to, to be said, not just about the ways in which enslaved Africans contributed this, this knowledge, but how it kind of caused the dramatic growth of profits flowing into South Carolina, but increasingly flowing into enslavers who had made massive investments in the success of African slavery in South Carolina. And so um, overall, the spread of slavery and the increasing numbers of enslaved Africans being uh, bought and sold from West Africa and the West Indies to South Carolina began to, again, change the demographic landscape of this colony. Um, that is to say that as more enslaved Africans came forcefully into South Carolina, so too, of course, did their ideas of rebellion. And so the fact that slavery, again, as this dominant institution became more visible in South Carolina in this period of time did not mean that enslaved Africans did not resist, did not rebel, and it meant that they actually did so sometimes in very violent ways. And so one of the most visible and most destabilizing for the white population, one of the biggest events that, that occurred in this period um, actually occurred in South Carolina, and that was called the Stono Rebellion. Um, it occurred on September 9th, 1739, and a group of enslaved Africans congregated in Charleston. They were shouting liberty and freedom, and they were ready to liberate themselves. And so they, they were led by an Angolan man named Jemmy, and the men and women were continuing to walk south of Charleston, re recruiting more enslaved Africans with them along the way. And by the time they stopped to rest for the, the, the night, night um, outside of Charleston, again, south of, of, of Charleston, their numbers approached about 100. And so what exactly triggered the Stono re Rebellion is not clear. Um, for my pur purposes, I do think that there is something to be said about enslaved Africans wanting to liberate them themselves, and why not? Um, there are some who believe that many enslaved men and women knew that small groups of runaways were actually making it successfully from South Carolina to Florida, where they were given a promise by the, the Spanish of not just freedom, but of land. And so, um, and so there, there is this idea that these kind of messages of freedom were filtering up from Spanish Florida and infiltrating enslaved communities in South Carolina. And it took this kind of crowdsourcing moment in September of 1739 for this rebellion to kind of erupt. And so they marched uh, again, south to Spanish Florida, killing 
about 20 to 25 white South Carolinians along the, the way. Um, in the, the end, their southward march was largely stopped vi violently. And in the end, ult ultimately about 30 enslaved Africans were killed, but at least 20 escaped. And so again, there is some, something to be, be said about freedom seeking being kind of built into the institution of slavery. And if we think about it, I think in kind of a diff different way, if we look at this connection between slavery and capitalism, um, in some ways we can perhaps understand the fact that enslaved Africans were attempting to claim property rights in themselves, attempting to claim their own bodies for their own op autonomy, especially within an economic system where investors, where capitalists, where enslavers were profiting um, hand over fist in many instances off of their bodies, off of their labor and off of their, their lives. Um, and so I think that this, this I, idea perhaps of freedom seeking being, um, being a way to understand how the enslaved were kind of capturing the economic power of their own bodies is, is a fascinating way to look at it. And so um, the Stono Re Rebellion had the potential to dramatically reorganize the ways in which white South Carolinians and in particular South Carolina lawmakers and enslavers thought about kind of laws and reg regulations of slavery. And even though in 1840, the South Carolina General Assembly started to uh, pass stronger slave regulations, interestingly enough, it didn't keep enslaved Africans from continuing to run away, continuing to freedom seek and continue to find ways to kind of chip at the foundation of, of slavery um, and the exploitation that, that was built within that institution. And so it was enslaved men and women's continued actions to create their own um, sources of freedom, their own experiences of autonomy, where my work on what I call the enslaved economy or the enslaved economy comes in. Because if we think about the fact that the enslaved didn't just participate in large scale rebellions, but they oftentimes were thinking of ways to kind of make their lives better on a day-to-day -day basis. And that may or may not have been a form of rebellion for them, but it was a tangible way to kind of push back on the exploitative and capitalist influences that shaped so many aspects of their, their lives. And again, shaped the growth of South Carolina's capitalist economy, not just in the 18th century, but in the 19th as, as well. And this is where I'm going to introduce again, an idea that I think is so fascinating and that's of the slaves economy. And so when I think of South Carolina and I think of slavery and I think of capitalism, interestingly enough, I do think about the ways that the enslaved were trying to create their own economic networks of trade, of barter, of stealing, of buying, all of this economic act activity was actually at the foundation in some ways of the kind of capitalist growth of slavery in South Carolina. And so in the low country in particular, from the first moment that enslaved men and women were brought and purchased by Carolina enslavers, enslaved men and women had been finding ways to trade on their own, to purchase goods that they wanted. And in general, they attempted to make money for them themselves. And this was called the slave's economy or the economic activity of the enslaved. And so enslaved men and women achieved a degree of economic independence. They were producing their own food, both for consumption and for sale. They were tending to their own small cash crops like um, pumpkins and squashes and uh, kind of anything that they could grow to sell. And they would then market and sell these goods to anyone who would buy them. Um, they were essentially participating in the economic lives of the communities in which they, they lived. And they were doing this, it, they were doing this as a way to perhaps pass down and bequeath property to their descendants. 
And so in, enslaved men and women were finding ways within, again, this violent and exploitative environment of slavery to kind of create their own economic networks, create their own genealogies of economic activity. And all of these activities were kind of part of the enslaved economy, but more directly, the work that enslaved men and women completed for themselves was an important part of their lives. And I'll talk about this in a few minutes, but increasingly it was an activity that enslavers recognized as, as well. Um, and this occurred all over the slave holding Atlantic world, not just in South Carolina, in places like Savannah, increasingly in New Orleans, in Bridgetown, Bar uh, Barbados, that was a major hub in Jamaica. Um, but in the low country, it was particularly visible. And enslaved Africans were taking advantage of the tiny bits of free time that they, they had to engage in these types of activities. Um, we might call it le uh, leisure or non-work time, but the fact of the matter is that they were working, but they were working for themselves, trying to find ways to make money that they could save and use as they, they wished. Um, and so, if we think about then the kind of structures that that allowed for this, I think it's fascinating. When when I first started this research, my first thought was, well, they how could this happen, right? How could the enslaved within an institution of slavery find ways to make make money? It must have been kind of an underground, a black market, if you will, but it wasn't. Um, and enslavers and lawmakers actually started to codify this type of activity. And so the first set of laws in Carolina was actually introduced by a Barbadian set of slave laws. And that first slave law in Barbados was ratified in 1661. It essentially said that, um, that no servant or slave could sell or trade any good without the express permission of their enslaver. And so in many ways, it meant that slaveholders were fully aware of this type of activity and even co-signed it. Um, and I'll talk in a few minutes about why that might have been. But, um, but if we look kind of at, again, this kind of set of laws, and I like to think of laws as a re reflection of a community's or a society's kind of best practices, right? Um, the first law created in South Carolina that recognized the enslaved economy was ratified in 1686, and it was called an, an act inhibiting the trading with servants or slaves. And what this essentially recognized was the visibility of the economic work of the enslaved outside of what we might call plantation work. And it said that no free man or free woman, servant or slave, was allowed to buy, sell, barter, contract, bargain, or exchange um, whatsoever with any other servant or slave. But there again is a caveat. This is without the express permission of their in, in slavery. And it was kind of a loophole. And so what that then means, what that then tells me is that this activity was actually not at all illegal because there were many instances in which enslavers were supportive. In fact, sometimes often forced enslaved men and women to go out there, find work, make money, bring back a certain percentage, and then they could keep a certain per percentage. And so this activity was actually fairly widespread and it was recognized fairly early in South Carolina law, um, a mere 16 years after the, uh, the colony was founded. And so, um, and so what this, this means too, is that we have the laws as written, but they failed actually to work. Um, enslaved women in particular were found in the Charleston a marketplace, oftentimes on Sundays, kind of selling and bartering goods. And, um, and the slaves economy was actually a, very, a fairly vibrant, visible aspect of life in Charleston specifically, but in South Carolina writ large. And this I think is a great um, newspaper uh, piece from 1772. 
And it says, I have seen, and it is from a, a visitor visiting South Carolina for, for the first time. And it says, um, I have seen these Negro women surround fruit carts in every street and purchase amongst them the whole contents to the exclusion of every white person. And I put this for emphasis, and they are your slaves who fix the exorbitant prices, which are given for most of the articles that are brought at the lower market. Um, and so I, I think this is, again, very fascinating because it tells us that not only were enslaved women out in the, the market selling goods, but they were setting prices. They were sometimes determining who they would sell to and for which price. And um, they were essentially trying to create this sense of kind of control and autonomy, again, within a very exploitative system. And if this was kind of the very narrow space in which they could um, kind of engage and barter with a white person, they would often do it. And, um, and what this, this meant was that this was actually fairly commonplace. Um, and I think, again, it's kind of a fascinating glimpse into looking at the ways that slavery evolved, but the ways that enslaved men and women were intimately connected to the growth of the South Carolina economy, but in perhaps um, a way that we often don't talk about. And, and I do love this. This, this is from um, about a century late, a later 1860, but this is, I think, rep representative of the ways in which South Carolina women, enslaved women, would attempt to kind of wedge themselves in these public marketplaces. And South Carolina and Charleston had one of the most visible and vibrant marketplaces in colonial America. And enslaved women were at the literal center of kind of commercial life, of economic life. They were selling um, food to um, ship captains, to mariners. They were essentially bringing food in from uh, surrounding plantations and um, enslavers or their wives would some, sometimes buy these, these goods. And so in many ways, they were very active participants, again, not just in the economic life of slavery in South Carolina, but they were active participants in the growth of capitalism in South Carolina as, as well. And so then if we shift just a little bit, um, if we talk about kind of the end of the American Re Revolution, independence from Britain for the American colonies, we also see an entrenchment of slavery occur in states such as South Carolina. And so with the talk of freedom and liberty swirling in the new, new nation, um, the enslaved were encountering dramatic changes to their, their lives. And this change revolved around the introduction of a product that would dramatically change and transform um, enslaved men and women's lives. Um, and that was the introduction of cotton. So the, the economy of South Carolina, again, was dominated by slave-grown rice in the colonial period. And rice, again, was the largest export of South Carolina for this period. Um, but after the patenting of the cotton gin in 1793 and the explosion of the, of the cotton industry in the 19th century in places west of the Carolinas and Georgia, um, South Carolina's export economy, South Carolina's economy of slavery started to shift as well from one that solely relied on rice to one that began to integrate short staple cotton. And so this shift, I think, had, again, a dramatic effect on the lives and experiences of the, the enslaved. And one um, traveler to South Carolina in the early 19th century said this, the staple commodity of the state is rice, but cotton is now eagerly cultivated. Um, it is the crop of cotton that the planter looks for the augmentation, the growth of his wealth. And what this meant is that short staple cotton quickly eclipsed rice as the dominant export that enslaved men and women in South Carolina produced. And this economic shift affected the, the, the lives and infected the economic lives of the enslaved. And so all of this is to say that cotton production increased exponentially. Um, and as you can see, this, this is not just for South Carolina, but for the, the nation writ large. Um, as you, you can see, 
the production of cotton went from 3,135 bales of cotton in 1790. And that was prime, a little bit of short staple, but primarily kind of long staple, very silky cotton. Um, to over 10 years later, uh, 73,000 bales of cotton about 10, 10 years later. And then if you kind of jump down to 1860, we see a massive growth. Um, that is 3.8 million bales of slave grown cotton. And so if we look at this, and this is just the production of raw cotton, this is outstanding. And then if you just go one year later in 1861, the first battle of the Civil War, we have um, enslaved men and women growing 4.485 million bales of cotton. And one bale of cotton is 500 pounds. And so we are talking about massive amounts of cotton cultivated by enslaved men and women for shipment to mills in places like Massachusetts or across the Atlantic to be sold in port cities such as Liverpool. And so enslaved men and women were again literally on the ground forcefully cultivating cotton that went to line the pockets of investors, of capitalists, of enslavers, of burgeoning industrialists. And this uh, production of cotton was what essentially catapulted the American economy to global prominence between 1800 and 1860. Um, and so to put a finer point on this, more than half of the exports from the United States in the first six decades of the 19th century, so that's 1800 to 1860, um, consisted of raw cotton. So more than half of the exports was raw cotton. And the vast majority of this was grown by enslaved men and women. And South Carolina was one of the largest exporters of cotton during this, this time. And um, someone, Brett or Robert, please tell me if I need to cut it short. <laughs> um, um, mm -hmm. This seven the social should stop now. Oh, well, uh, Dr. Hill, uh, Edwards, I've been yes. seeing that just to wrap it up in a, a, a timely fashion. Okay, I will, let me do three more slides and then I'll be good. Uh, go right ahead. Okay, and so the experiences of one enslaved person I think really captures how the introduction of cotton harvesting technologies changed the economy of slavery in South Carolina, particularly at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, and so one of the greatest fears of an enslaved person came true for a man named Charles Ball. Uh, his enslaver sold him when he was 30 to a slave trader who was bound for the Carolinas and Georgia, and he was born with his family in Maryland. Um, and so the introduction of the cotton gin and again the rapid expansion of the cotton economy um, shaped his life in dramatic and dangerous ways. Um, and so in 1837 he published um, his autobiography entitled Slavery in the United States after he escaped to freedom. Um, and he writes about not just kind of witnessing uh, the growth of cotton, but he actually talked a little bit too about how enslaved men and women like him would kind of find ways to kind of carve out their own economic activity. Um, and it's fairly commonplace. It wasn't anything that was seen as undermining the institution of slavery or undermining an enslaver's power. And that I think is, is fascinating because I'll, I'll talk about this hopefully in the Q&A a little bit more, but um, I kind of went into this work think, thinking that um, there was a tight connection between kind of capitalist enterprise and freedom. Or, mm -hmm. um, or capitalist enterprise and the ability for the, the enslaved to attain more freedom, perhaps to buy their, their freedom, but that is not what, what I found. Instead, I found that enslavers were actually very good at finding ways not just to profit from um, the economic activities of the, the enslaved, but doing so kind of quite freely. And so this is a, a quote, um, from um, kind of a trade magazine for in, enslavers and, and planters in the 1830s. Um, and this enslaver essentially says, I never allow my slave to sell anything without my permission. I never restrict them in acts of industry, right? 
but I re reward them for their exertions by taking them at a fair price, whatever they choose to sell. Um, and so what this again tells me is that perhaps um, our understanding of the ways in which capitalism functioned and grew um, should be different, especially if we look at the lives of the, the enslaved in particular in a place like South Carolina. And, um, and this is um, another enslaver from, from South Carolina, Charles C. Pinckney, actually writing about how he, he did this. And he was pretty unabashed about the benefits that he gained from engaging in this type of activity and the ways in which um, he may not have considered himself a capitalist, but I surely do. And he saw this type of activity going hand in hand with the profits that he was making from his investments in slavery and in cotton. And so I will stop there and turn on my light. And I look forward to any questions that anyone has about this broad topic of slavery and capitalism. All right, thank you so much, Justine, for that great presentation. Give her a round of applause. Let me turn on my light. And do a, a brief Q&A. Are there any questions for Dr. Edwards about her presentation? Any questions? I have a question. Go ahead, please. Hi. Dr. Edwards, I'm in Charleston and I grew up in Charleston. And as you spoke about the enslaved person having, enslaved people having an economy, <clears throat> I'm wondering whether or not the, the uh, what we see in the early 20th century of women selling sweetgrass baskets and flowers in the market area of Charleston at the Four corners of law, if you're familiar with Charleston, the corner of Broad and Meeting Street, mm -hmm. whether or not that economic activity is a is a carryover from that um, uh, activity doing enslavement. Yes, thank uh, thank you. That that is a great question. And yes, it is. You can trace that type of activity, especially the vis visibility of the women selling those beautiful baskets. Um, this is a vestige of the types of activities that enslaved uh, women were engaged in during the period of slavery. It directly connects, so yes. Um, and there are some, some other great kind of pictures and paintings of enslaved women kind of making baskets. And these, these baskets, again, were, were used to clean rice. Yes. And so there is a direct connection, yes, which is, I think, just kind of fascinating and some, something that needs to be kind of further publicized because it is there. And there is a direct linkage be between what enslaved women did during the period of slavery and what we see today with Black women in particular kind of being in these spaces and selling these, these goods and these products. If I can ask one more quick question. Sure. I've, I've, I've sort of skimmed through the Shaftesbury papers. And I think there is a reference to an enslaved man named Emmanuel, who was one of the enslaved people who came with the, the English colonists from Barbados. Do you know if there are any records identifying people from Barbados, from Bridgetown or Spitestown who came to Charleston directly, but not from the Rice Coast, but from Barbados to Charleston? And if, there, if there's a list of names or do we know who those people were? were? Well, I, I have not found those, those records and it does, it does not mean that they don't exist. Um, but in my research in the South Carolina Historical Society and the South Carolina De Department of Archives and History, I didn't find them, but it uh, doesn't mean that they don't exist. And in fact, I think, I do wonder if in Peter Wood's book, Black Majority, if he has a fleeting reference to them, but it's been a little yeah. bit of time tracking it down. Actually, I spent quite a bit of time <laughs> tracking it down. Uh, okay. And I, right. I, I could, could not trace those names directly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we've got a, a question in the chat from Cecil Rigby. I'll just read the question for you. And Is there evidence this. that slaves may have tried to ally with South Carolina natives, indigenous peoples, to escape their situation before or after the Stoner Rebellion via the Indian road from the low country to the up country? Yes. 
Um, there is some really great scholarship on the connections be between enslaved Africans and the indigenous communities that lived in the Carolinas. Uh, I can't think of the name off the top of my head. I think there is a really good book about the Great Dismal Swamp that came out recently. Um, and so, yes, I mean, there the connections between enslaved Africans and indigenous communities, uh, I think is a really fascinating one because I think it perhaps challenges or at times upsets our, our understanding of those relationships, especially in terms of thinking about the often violent interactions between enslaved Africans, Native Americans, and um, white, white colonists. Yes, this is the, the book. Thank you. Um, the history of, Mar of maroon communities in general, I think is, is, is such a fascinating and underexplored one. And yes, you should most cer certainly check out this, this book because it just came out, I think last year, is that right, Robert? Um, and so I think um, that might be a great book to really explore these connections. And, and for those in the audience, the book that we're talking about, I just put a link to it in the chat and we'll get this link out to you guys as well after class. It's called Dismal Freedom uh, by J. Brett Morris. It's a wonderful book that actually talks a bit about the room communities, which we'll touch on a bit more tonight and next week as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Anson, I see your hand is up. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. And we'll come back to a question in the chat. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate you. Uh, um, um, for your time here and your presentation and your research and congratulations uh, on the book. Uh, what a title and what an interesting um, topic and subject. And um, so I wanted to ask the question, you had mentioned uh, in your discussion of the slaves economy, which I found intriguing because I had never really heard of this um, before. Um, but in particular, you had come in with maybe a hypothesis or some assumptions on the relation of, of this um, economy, uh, the sort of um, independent economy uh, among the enslaved um, and the relation of that to, to freedom. And what immediately came to mind was what, um, Maybe if we say in the in the modern day system of, of wage slavery, what mm -hmm. someone like Jerry Ball would call the myth and propaganda of, of black buying power. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wondered if you had any thoughts on on that, um, or if you had in your scholarship um, made any connections between that. Mm -hmm. Again, this is something I had never heard of, but it was something that just came to mind. Um, yeah. Sure. No, that 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 is a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that this I, idea of wage slavery, I think if we look at kind of its longer history, the the slaves economy plays pretty prominently in our our understanding. I mean, if we think about the fact that yes, these types of economic activities, the economic networks existed. And yes, enslaved women in particular were fairly visible in terms of their trading activities, in terms of haggling with buyers, both black and white. Um, but so few could actually earn enough to buy their freedom. I think that that is both fascinating and devastating. Um, I talk about this, I think it's in chapter four of the, the book. I, I talk about Denmark Vesey and the fact that he has to win a lottery to buy his freedom and only because his enslaver were kind of his, his enslavers actually accepted his payment and didn't actually ask for the entire money that he bought in his lottery. Like these circumstances were extraordinary. And so in many ways it was enslaved men and women in extraordinary circ circumstances, figuring out how not just to work their butts off, not just to save enough, but to negotiate with their enslaver who negotiated with them to buy their, their freedom was amazing. 
but in many ways they could only if they if they even earned enough money to buy themselves their families were often still left in enslaved and i think that that is a broader takeaway that is just kind of a gut punch right um and so then taking a step back i think about how um i think about how in our american kind of western lexicon the idea of capitalism is often tethered to this I idea of freedom, right? The more money that one has, the more money, power, and influence one can buy. Um, and that is what the enslaved were trying to do, but they were still connected and tethered to this institution that profited off of their exploitation. And so I found that um, even though I think that these types of economic net networks were amazing and outstanding. I kind of still look at them as a way that the, the enslaved were essentially kind of working more to ensure their continued connection to slavery and to their, their enslavers. And I think that that tells me a kind of bigger message about the limits of the relationship be between capitalism and freedom. And I think, um, this be, becomes an even more fraught, problematic connection when we take the, the institutional forms of slavery out of the picture, so, so to speak. And so if we look at the period of reconstruction, um, we see the formerly enslaved really attempting to work, to save money, to buy land, and their land claims being overturned. They're constantly being live living under kind of white terrorist regimes while still trying to support themselves and their their families and so i see this connection being a, a very fraught one and, and and i think in many ways that is kind of at the crux of my my research is de detangling these I ideas about the relationship between capitalism and freedom Excellent. We're going to go next to uh, Kathleen, and then we'll have a few questions in the chat. And then at some point, I have to cover Revolutionary War tonight. So uh, we have time for a few more questions. Kathleen, please go right ahead. Yes. Um, on my first job, I had to buy my own uniform to work. And I'm wondering if part of the enslavers' mentality was let's let them this um, enslaved grow their own food then I won't have to do that let them earn some money and they can buy their own clothes um, and, and I just felt some of this might have been shifting the cost of owning people to the people who were owned exactly exactly I, I talk about this in chapter five of the, of the book and I kind of a gesture towards it when, when I talk about um, uh, when, when I talk about accounting, but yes, that that is exactly what happened. Increasingly starting in the 1820s and 30s, enslavers started to fi figure out that um, they could actually profit more from not providing their enslaved la laborers with food and clothing but they could incentivize the enslaved to work more to purchase from them clothing and food and all of those goods that they needed to live. Um, and so not only did enslavers figure this, this out, they started implementing these types of techniques and they even started writing about them. They started accounting for them. And so I found these amazing and wonderful account books when where in enslavers were like tracking how much an enslaved person had in their account and withdrawing money whenever an enslaved person wanting wanted to buy a hat or shoes or another pair of pants or even things like sugar coffee and whiskey um and so if we think about again the institution of slavery as being fundamentally exploitative Enslavers were finding ways to make it even more exploitative for the, the enslaved. And in my, my mind, this is kind of one of those shifts that kind of shifted the institution of slavery, especially in a place like South Carolina, even more to one where the kind of external capitalist influences are infiltrating how enslavers were thinking about engaging with their enslaved laborers. I think it's, um, it is kind of a fascinating shift that 
I talk quite a bit about in chapter five of the, the book. All right, now there is an interesting question in the chat, uh, a follow up from Cecil Rigby, where he asked, was there a fear among the uh, South Carolina legislature concerning alliances between black and indigenous peoples? Mm. Um, oh, that is a good question. Not that I recall in the laws, but that does not mean that they're, they're not there. Um, if I could speculate, I would say that they were probably more concerned about the enslaved running away and seek, seeking refuge with Native American communities than, than anything else. Um, the problem, the fear of, of runaway slaves was pretty rampant. Um, especially when we talk about around these major moments of re rebellion. And so Stono, surely um, during the American Rev Revolution, when slaves are kind of running away by the tens of th thousands, um, most certainly around the rebellion in Saint-Domingue, the Haitian Revolution, there was a lot of fear about that. Um, but yeah, it, from what I re recall from the historical record, especially the legal sources and the, the laws, most of the concerns were about runaway slaves and the, the enslaved running to Native American communities seeking refuge. Um, you're, you're right, C Cecil mentions exactly because Native Americans had a very clear sense of the geographical landscape. And that is what uh, made enslavers fearful. Okay, now uh, Tiaba has an interesting question in the chat. Um, have you seen any correlation between cotton or certain crops and enslavement or forced labor in other parts of the world? And she's thinking in particular about how 20% of the world's cotton comes from the Uyghur region in China, which mm. has a million people in forced labor and re-education camps. Mm. That is a good question. Um, I, I, I would speculate that, that yes. And I think the the region that I know the the most about that I I find incredibly fascinating is um, Northern Africa, in particular, e Egypt. And so, in the period, kind of immediately at the end of the Civil War into the late 1860s and early 1870s, there were actually former members of the Confederacy that went to Northern Africa to kind of install Southern forms of cotton cultivation in this region. And so after the fall of the Confederacy, Northern Africa became one of the greatest exporters of cotton. And um, some historians, some scholars speculate that one of the reasons why it's be because former members of the Confederacy were traveling there and kind of te uh, teaching cotton planters in Northern Africa the techniques that they they use. And so I wouldn't be so surprised if they were kind of talking about regimes of forced labor as well to compel laborers to produce increasing amounts of cotton. Especially to be, be because cotton cultivation is known as being incredibly labor intensive and violent. Um, so I would not at all be surprised. Uh, Mary Joyce has a question. Uh, do you know who the early investors were in developing the trade of slaves and rice in South Carolina? Um, the early investors from what, what, what I understand were kind of small scale bankers in places like London and Liverpool. And so there were those kind of financial ties and connections as well. And they had investments and ties and connections to Barbados has as well. And so in and so in many ways, South Carolina was just an extension of their increasing investments in slavery and sugar in particular in places like Barbados and then increasingly Jamaica. Uh, and finally from Denise, uh, she had a question. I think this is more of a clarification that you can offer here. So slaves were paid during the 1830s, first time hearing this. I think that's in reference to what you're talking about with the the, the enslaved actually finding ways to sell products in Charleston and elsewhere. Could you elaborate on that one more time? Sure. Um, and so when, when I talk about um, enslaved men and women being, being paid, I'm talking about, especially in the 1820s and 30s, being paid by their enslavers. Um, uh, slaveholders were kind of unabashed about 
paying enslavement and women for cultivating corn, for cultivating extra amounts of cotton, um, for cul uh, cultivating food and li livestock, um, livestock like chickens, and they would sometimes sell eggs. And so, um, yes, it was not at all uncommon, which again, it just kind of blows my my mind. But in terms of um, enslaved women in particular, but increasingly enslaved men, um, they were finding ways to earn money and wages from the colonial period. And so in many ways, this type of activity was very much intertwined in the foundations and the growth of slavery from as early as the late 17th century. And finally, uh, from Marla, she asked, do we know how many Native Americans were enslaved and traded for African slaves? Oh, that I am not sure of. Um, that I am not sure. Um, I can think of, I may have to get back to you or, or, or Brett about some, some work on that, but, um, but that I am unsure of. No, and, and to add to your, your answer there, from last week, Professor Judge noted that there was a trade of indigenous peoples, like the Yamasee and others, mm -hmm. from into the Caribbean. We want to keep that in mind, too. Um, the numbers, again, go to the thousands, and the Yamasee tribe was ravaged by that slave, that slave trade in the early 18th century. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind, too. Yeah, which, which I think is... is is fascinating and dev devastating as well, right? The, the, the fact that colonists were increasingly kind of going to war with Native Americans, the Yabjimasi is a per perfect example, is a way to re remove them from their, their land. And instead of just, instead of kind of going to war to the, the death, they would enslave them and sell them to enslavers in the, the Caribbean and it further, um, kind of communicates this I idea of slavery, of war in many ways, having kind of an economic just justification in ways that perhaps we oftentimes underestimate. Fantastic. So thank you again, Dr. Edwards, for a great presentation this evening. Another round of applause. Thank you for having me. And I'm going to do now is do a, a speed run through about a century of South Carolina history. Because, because what, what Mother Edwards has done for us this evening is she's really set us up to understand how the, um, the institutions of slavery and capitalism are intertwined via the lens of South Carolina history. And so what I'm going to do is kind of reinforce that, but also at the same time, talk a bit about what else is going on in the colony in that century, including up through the Revolutionary War. So I will try to get through this as quickly as possible so we can also have time for Q&A after that as well. Now, to start us off, I do want to first show a resource that I would really encourage folks to use. And this is the um, animated interactive map of the slave trade. So I'm going to go to this really quickly, and I want to really show what this is. I'm going to try to share my screen and see if this will work okay. All right. And this is a website. I'll put a link to it uh, in the chat this evening. Um, but slate.com has a map, an interactive map that actually shows the slave trade. And I often show this to my students, and I think this would be useful for everyone here as well. It's from the Slave Voyages website. So if you click on the play button at the top, it, it shows you really the history of slavery via this map. Um, and every single dot on the map represents a slave ship going across the Atlantic. And initially, you only see a handful. But I think this map, as it becomes more and more congested with more and more ships, it really shows the history of slavery um, in particular, you notice that the majority of the ships are actually going towards Brazil and the Caribbean. Um, but you will eventually start to see more and more going to North America as well. Now, an important part of this story, again, is the creation of, of race. And we got some of that this evening from uh, Dr. Edwards. We got some of this last week from Professor Judge and also Dr. Goldman. But one of the things you want to keep in mind is how as this slave trade becomes more lucrative, 
as slavery itself becomes the backbone of both colonialism in the Americas and capitalism in Europe, the linking of skin color to slavery becomes more and more pronounced. That is especially true in South Carolina. So as an example here, we'll just stop, pause here. Let's click on a ship. Um, each dot gives you a different story. This is the Hiscox, uh, Hiscox from Great Britain. This 180 ton ship left West Central Africa or St. Helena with 508 enslaved people and arrived in Charleston, South Carolina with 435. It made two journeys between 1736 and 1739 and trans transported a total of 689 Africans. This is just one ship of many that made this trip across the Atlantic. But the question we want to ask ourselves in the Majesca School, I think is twofold. Number one, how did this slavery, this enslavement, affect the growth of Carolina colony. Now, Dr. Edwards has gone through this pretty extensively tonight, but that leads us to a second question, which is, what was the relationship? And really, what is the relationship in South Carolina in both the 18th century and today between race and labor? Because this is gonna create a colony that is unique in how it deals with these ideas of, of slavery, labor issues and the like that still affects South Carolina to this day. Uh, so I will put this, a link to this in the chat and we'll get it out uh, later this evening as well. Um, but I want to go ahead and get to my presentation uh, just for a few minutes at least to kind of get us Revolutionary War. And I, I'm glad that Dr. Edwards did a great job in talking about these Goose Creek men, these mysterious figures and the history of our state who actually had an oversized influence on South Carolina, even up to the present day. Now, as Dr. Edwards mentioned before, as we discussed last week as well, a, a good part of our story actually begins um, in Barbados. Um, <clears throat> all right, so a big part of our story is all about how um, Barbados becomes a major part of the story of Carolina Colony, right? And how it's founded because of what's going on in Barbados, desire for additional land for slavery, but also a desire to have a place from which people in Barbados could get food supplies, etc. In essence, they wanted to stretch their legs. Let's not forget that either. But the thing about Carolina Colony, and I was telling folks before the class began, this is really interesting to note. When you're thinking about Carolina Colony, it's important to note that England's attempt to colonize it in the 1660s was actually the third time a European power tried to colonize what would become known as South Carolina. First time, of course, was what uh, Professor Judge discussed last week with San Miguel de Guadalupe in 1526. Mm -hmm. By 1562, the French also tried to colonize what is now Paris Island in a place called Charlesport. Um, that endeavor also failed as well. And I kind of wonder if there was something going on here where a great <laughs> power, whether it was God or the flying <laughs> spaghetti monster, what have you, was saying, don't found South Carolina, but the English finally nailed it in the 1660s, for better and for worse. <laughs> but what's also important to note about Carolina Colony um, and its growth during this time period is how so much of this is tied to slavery. I'm gonna to try to show an image here really quickly that I think really gets this across pretty well. Okay, now you see this map, this actually shows you um, what the slave trade, where it was drawing enslaved peoples from. And as Dr. Edwards mentioned a few moments ago, uh, one of the things that's important to note is that with slavery in the Americas, they weren't just drawing Africans from random places. They were often drawing um, Africans from different parts of West and Southwest Africa, depending on the kinds of skills they brought with them. So for example, in South Carolina, 
They were looking for people who were enslaved, who were specialists in rice cultivation and the like. And you see here on the map, you see several different places here. This is the Gold Coast. There's the Windward Coast right next to it. The Nene. Many other enslaved peoples in South Carolina came from West Central Africa, otherwise known as Angola. And this is where many of the enslaved in Carolina colony came from. They were mostly Congos and Angolans. But what about the actual colony of South Carolina? Again, the colony itself is being regulated primarily for the sake of growing the slave trade. But it is important to note that South Carolina was a proprietary colony. Now, Dr. Edwards already mentioned this and talked about it in depth, but it's worth repeating that the colony, unlike most of the other British North American colonies, wasn't founded for religious freedom or run away from persecution, it was founded for the explicit purpose of spreading slavery. So what this meant was while it was a proprietary colony, it wasn't directly ruled by England. Instead, the colonists kind of really had their own self-government. The proprietors back in London were seen as being largely aloof, away from the colony, not really addressing its main needs. And this actually leads in 1719 to the proprietary government being overthrown by the white citizens of South Carolina. Uh, it was a bloodless coup. It's often referred to as the revolution of 1719. But in essence, their grievances were quite simple. They weren't getting the kind of support they needed from the proprietors. And so they were asking for England to take the right control of the colony and make it a royal colony, which would eventually happen. But a big part of the history of South Carolina in this early colonial period is about the growing pains it experienced as a colony, both in terms of continuing the slave trade and trying to profit off of that, but also in terms of the sheer colonization of the landmass of South Carolina, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Again, one of the things that we've talked about already is the Stone Rebellion, right? And this map, I think, provides some good context for this. Um, as we've already discussed, there are some historians who believe a major impetus for the Stone Rebellion was that the enslaved Africans were actually trying to escape south to Spanish-held Florida. By 1739, tensions between Spain and England over colonies in North America and elsewhere let the Spanish government to announce that if any enslaved Africans made it to Spanish Florida, they would not only receive their freedom, but they would also have the opportunity to uh, have military service in the Spanish military fighting against England. Now, the Stone Rebellion is also notable because we believe most of the folks involved in it were actually from the Congo Kingdom. And we now think, and we're not 100% sure about this, but we now believe that many of those who participated in the revolt may themselves have been soldiers back in Africa, which would explain some of the tactics they use. They, again, I cannot emphasize enough how close they come to making it to Spanish floor. Um, at one point, they actually come very close to capturing the governor of the colony, um, who was able to then call out um, the militia to subdue the rebellion. But, as we've already noted, that rebellion leads to the Negro Act of 1740, which puts in various restrictions on what little freedoms the enslaved Africans have. So again, after that, they are not allowed to congregate in large groups. They're not allowed to read or write. And in fact, the Negro Act of 1740 would be in effect in South Carolina up until 1865. So it goes through the period of colonization, to the period of the early republic, all the way through the civil war itself. That law, over, that series of laws governs how the Africans or enslaved Africans are treated in South Carolina. Now, again, we really can't talk about South Carolina without pointing out that many of the place names in the state, uh, many of the street names right here in Columbia are named after the enslavers, or the Confederates, so on and so forth. Uh, Henry Lawrence is a good example of this. Uh, Lawrence, of course, would be a major figure 
in South Carolina's colonial history, revolutionary era history. Um, and he made a good chunk of his fortune off of the buying and selling of enslaved Africans. Um, again, this really shows how the slave trade was integral to South Carolina. But I think this is kind of an important thing to think about here. A lot of the early history of South Carolina focuses on what we now call the low country, right? The Carolina colony begins in Charlestown and slowly spreads further inland. And by the middle of the 18th century, you start to see the development of various regions of South Carolina, at least European development, I want to make that clear. The indigenous peoples, of course, were living all throughout the area before European colonization. But by the 1740s, 50s, and especially 1760s, you are starting to see thousands more uh, white colonists, mostly from Great Britain, starting to move further inland, out of the low country and into the Midlands. Again, a principal reason is slavery, but not in the way you think. Many of the folks moving into the Midlands and eventually the upstate as well are actually individuals who do not own slaves. They are independent, what we call yeoman farmers. And many of them are bristling at the idea of competing economically with white colonists who own slaves. Now, this is not just a South Carolina problem. For example, you may be surprised to know that at one point in the 18th century, the British North American city with the second largest population of enslaved peoples was actually New York City. And in the early 18th century, New York experiences a series of slave revolts and rumored slave revolts that are largely caused by economic competition on the one hand between people who own slaves and on the other hand, independent farmers, laborers and so forth, especially in New York City. So this wasn't just a South Carolina issue, but in South Carolina, it is pushing some white farmers and laborers to move further inland. And so part of South Carolina's history as a colony and a state is, of course, about the conflict between Black and white, but it's also about the conflict amongst white laborers, those who own slaves versus those who do not own slaves but may want to own some down the road they can make enough money what was to purchase an enslaved person. Now, this leads to what's called the regulator movement, right? Regulator movement is basically South Carolina's inland residents saying, hey, we're moving further inland, we're moving further inland. Where are the judges? Where's the infrastructure? Where are the sheriff's deputies to provide law and order in the back country of South Carolina? In essence, it was non-existent. And the regulators are, for the most part, men, white men in South Carolina who live in the upstate, who live in the Midlands, who some of them own slaves, some of them not own slaves, but they are united by a belief that far too much government power and authority is invested in Charleston and the low country. And so they tell the royal officials, hey, we need more support. We need more people to help us actually regulate the back country. And by 1768 and 1769, they even march on Charleston. Um, get the attention of the royal government, and the government agrees to help them. Now, during this regulator crisis, you do have scenes of violence in the back country where civilians are killing purported criminals, uh, capturing others, and quote unquote, bringing them to justice, that sort of thing. But it highlights some tensions between the low country and the rest of South Carolina that will further help to explain some of the political economic and social divides in the state that still linger even in the 21st century. Now, you'll be surprised to know that one of the leaders of the regulator movement was Patrick Calhoun. Calhoun, yes, he was the father of John C. Calhoun. Um, so you already see how pivotal figures in the state's history have a lineage that goes way, way back. And of course, this will not be the last time we hear about the Calhouns in this semester. Okay, and again, this map here um, kind of shows how the state was divided after 1769. The, the royal government divides the state 
into various districts. Of course, you see, uh, you have Beaufort, Charlestown, and Georgetown on the coast, the low country, but you see more development in Camden, uh, Chiraw District, and especially the Orangeburg District uh, that you start to see more development in. And 96th District is sparsely populated at this point. You start seeing more movement after Revolutionary War into that part of South Carolina. But speaking of the revolution, the regulator movement actually highlights the fact that in the South, you have colonists who are deeply concerned with how the British royal government is not helping them develop the lands that they are starting to move into. Um, and again, this goes back to Professor Judge's lecture last week on indigenous removal, how the removal of indigenous tribes leads to more white European settlement in these places in the back country and elsewhere. But that also causes tension with Great Britain. Um, again, the British in London are telling the colonists in North America, hey, could you please stop moving further and further west? Because it's causing more and more tensions with the indigenous tribes. Now, I think everyone in this room and on Zoom has heard the term, no taxation without representation, right? One of the key causes of the Revolutionary War. Well, hmm. what were the taxes for? Uh, the British began levying taxes in the 1760s to pay off their debts from the previous wars in the 18th century, and also to provide for security for the 13 colonies from 1763 on. The British had made deals with indigenous tribes to stop further westward expansion. And many elite Americans, including George Washington, as an example, made a lot of money off of surveying land in the West and actually speculating on how much that, how valuable that land actually was. This causes more and more tensions amongst the colonists with Great Britain and with each other as well. Now in South Carolina, you start to see this manifest itself in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, in Charleston, in December of 1773, they host a tea party, which was actually held a few days before the more famous tea party in Boston, mm -hmm. thus beginning a history of New England and New York getting more uh, attention and media coverage in the South, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> actually, a reason for this is actually very simple. The Charleston Tea Party, because it was in Charleston, uh, it does involve the people of Charleston taking over a ship, but then they peacefully take the tea and store it in a storehouse in Charleston. So there's no dumping of tea <laughs> over the ship sides or anything like that. It was very peaceful. It was very Charlestonian. However, South Carolina, along with the other colonies in North America, uh, begin agitating against the lack of representation in Parliament. They are angered over taxation. They also want trade with other European nations. And eventually this leads to the American Revolution starting in 1775. Now, the story of the revolution in the South in the few minutes I have left is a complicated one. So I'll get through this as quickly as possible. But one of the reasons the revolution in the South, especially South Carolina is so bloody is because the threat the revolution might be to the institution of slavery itself. For example, in late 1775 in Virginia, the governor there, Lord Dunmore, issues what is known to history as Lord Dunmore's proclamation, where he essentially announces that if any enslaved Africans flee from the patriots and join the British forces, they will be quickly granted their freedom. Now, when Lord, Lord Dunmore's proclamation is made public throughout the South in late 1775 and early 1776, it causes a massive uproar because, and this goes back to Cecil's question about slave revolts, slave insurrections. There was always a fear, especially in the Southern colonies, of a large scale slave revolt. And certainly the history of the Western hemisphere up to this point made that fear understandable. There were numerous attempts at slave revolts in Cuba, in Brazil, in New York, other parts of British North America, such as Jamaica. And so for the American colonists, there was no 
they they had every reason in the world to believe that Lord the Moore Proclamation would lead to a massive slave revolt. Also, the Continental Army under George Washington that same year had actually banned the use of black troops in the US Army. Some militias in New England were using black soldiers to stay in the war for the duration. But it wasn't until after the, the calamitous defeat of Washington's army in New York, the retreat to Valley Forge in 1777 and 78, where Washington changed his mind and allowed the use of black soldiers for the American army. But Lord Dunmore's proclamation, in case you don't know, is something that you see actually referenced a lot if you actually sit down and read the Declaration of Independence. Here's an excerpt from that declaration. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, mm. whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions, end quote. This part of the Declaration of Independence is blaming King George III for both the potential for warfare with the indigenous peoples and domestic insurrections, a reference to the fears of slave revolt throughout the colonies. By the way, uh, NPR, National Public Radio, reads declaration every year on the 4th of July. And every single year, they get complaints about this section because folks don't realize they're reading the actual declaration. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Revolutionary War in the South um, really picks up in 1777 and 1778. Make a very long story short, the first few years of the conflict, the British military is focused most of its efforts on New England and New York. By 1778, in fact, they have taken New York City, uh, Philadelphia, other major cities in the North. The British assume that if they take the major cities of North America, they will win the war. So they find themselves bogged down fighting off really an insurgency, a countryside, unable to control rural places all across British held North America. Very familiar story for the US military in the present day. So the British decide to change tactics and they shift south. In 1778, they take Savannah. In 1779, they lay siege to Charleston. Why are they doing this? The British believe that the majority of white Southerners are actually either loyalists or loyalists adjacent even after Lord Dunmore's proclamation. And they believe they could just deliver a few blows to the Southern cause, it'll collapse like a house of cards, and that'll be it for the American Revolution. Charleston does eventually fall by 1780, but to the surprise of the British, that does not break the back of the American resistance. In fact, it actually stiffens. In case you aren't aware, <laughs> South Carolina, is actually the site of the largest number of battles of any of the colonies in the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. And these battles proved to be pivotal. While the British were able to take Charleston and they actually hold the city until 1782, what they find is that it's very difficult for them to navigate for the rest of the state safely. Uh, if you've seen the film, The Patriot, which if you haven't, don't worry about it. But <laughs> if, if you have seen it, if you have seen it, um, it kind of gives a fictionalized account of what this battle was like, where the British in the film are repeatedly being picked off in the swamps of South Carolina by snipers. Uh, they are finding it difficult to transport supplies from the state. Um, we're really close to Congaree National Park, which was a site of several American Revolutionary era battles and was also a place that was difficult to navigate in the 18th century. But, and still is today, as a matter of fact. Um, <laughs> actually, I know people who work there who told stories of folks in the 21st century getting lost, having compasses, smartphones, doesn't matter. So imagine not having any of that living in 1779, South Carolina. But thanks to things like Francis Marion's guerrilla war against the British colonists and so forth, eventually the tide does turn in the state. But what I really want to point out here is not just the battles of the Revolutionary War, which we could spend all night talking about, um, 
But instead, I want to talk a bit more about what the war looks like on the ground. For example, indigenous tribes living in the upstate find themselves caught between a rock and a hard place. And some of the Cherokee actually fight alongside the British against the Americans, ultimately resulting in their defeat. And then there's slavery during the Revolutionary Era. There are actually two periods in US history where slavery was greatly disrupted. One, of course, was the US Civil War, which we'll talk more in depth about in two classes from now. But the other one was the Revolutionary War. About 25,000 enslaved people in South Carolina during the course of the war escaped from slavery. Some of them go off to join the fight alongside the Americans. Others join the British Army and the Redcoats. Most of them actually just leave the state. They just go elsewhere. They go to the swamps of Congaree. They go north into North Carolina. They go south into Georgia and perhaps Florida. Slavery is greatly disrupted by the Revolutionary War because contrary to our popular belief and popular imagination of the war as being a war between orderly armies of redcoats and blue-coated patriots. In the South, it's really a civil war where you often have American patriots fighting against American loyalists in Charleston, in Camden, in the upstate, all over the place. There are numerous actions where civilians are murdered for supporting the wrong side in the wrong part of the state. But the enslaved sense it as an opportunity to escape the freedom. Because again, civil society and civil order in the state has fallen apart almost thoroughly during the Revolutionary War. But the authorities John in South, South Carolina, I include folks like Christopher Gadsden, uh, who was the inventor of the Don't Tread on Me flag um, that was used as a symbol of colonial resistance in the 1770s. But of course, we know today it has a very different connotation. So whenever you see the so-called Gadsden flag, just know that's a, a cyclone of native invention, which with the current political connotation, not actually that surprising. <laughs> and also you have other figures like John Rutledge and William Henry Drayton, who become pivotal leaders during the Revolutionary War. Uh, Drayton actually serves as a delegate to the Congress. Um, he dies in Philadelphia in 1779 at 37 years of age, but before his death, um, he is a pivotal figure representing the state to the kind of Congress. And then we have John Rutledge, who we'll talk much more about next week, who plays a role in the state during the Revolutionary War, but is equally pivotal during the writing of the Constitution, which we'll discuss more in depth next class. But I wanna end with this. So as the revolution is going on, the 13 colonists have to figure out how do we govern ourselves? How do we pool our resources to fight this war against the largest empire on earth at that time? Well, the Congress creates the Articles of Confederation in 1778 and South Carolina becomes the first state to approve those articles. That same year, the state also approves its first state constitution, again, recognizing itself as no longer being a part of the British Empire. Now, next week, when we come back, what we're getting into is how the Articles of Confederation and that state constitution are both thoroughly rejected by 1790, and how South Carolina plays an important, perhaps outsized role in the writing of the federal constitution. All right, so we have about five minutes left. Um, and do apologize for going through that so quickly, but are there- I, mean, I think you can watch five minutes over that everyone will forgive you, so I oh, don't know. Sure, that, that's not a problem. Don't so wait. Any, any questions at all? Hmm. Dr. Green, I have a question for you and for us to reflect on, and it's it based on Dr. Edwards' book about the, what she considers to be kind of the unique circumstances of the enslaved population in early South Carolina mm -hmm. that she sees having a continuing influence 
she mentions in her book several times that, but we didn't get into it tonight. What is your take in regards to the influence that could have had South Carolina having the only in the, the only majority black legislature after reconstruction, or even further down the road when there was, as the the the, the white modern plantation owners would say. South Carolina had an easier transition into the civil rights period. But what, what do you for, infer from that period, that 200 year period where the development of the enslaved people in South Carolina had a, a different impact on both white and black people? What do you infer the, the take forwards with that? takeaways from that period? Right, that's an, an excellent question and a really important question to grapple with. Um, demographics of South Carolina, you have to understand, are different even from other slave states, mm -hmm. right? The very fact that it's a majority enslaved population state is going to have an influence on how the state A sees itself, certainly, in terms of its laws, but also in terms of how the state thinks about slavery. Now, the South, of course, as we're going to see in the next few weeks, Southern states will see slavery as essential to their very way of life, their very existence. But for South Carolina, that becomes a particularly existential problem, meaning for many of the elite in the state, they cannot imagine South Carolina without slavery or later on without white supremacy. It is as simple as that. And this is also going to have a big influence on how they see the enslaved Black population and later the Black population during Jim Crow as a unique threat. Because again, if you're in a state where you are the minority, then you have to think of perhaps taking extraordinary measures to keep social control. I mean, think of example, a more recent example being South Africa, for instance, and the methods they use to keep apartheid going. I think South Carolina is the same, and this affects how the state sees itself, affects institutions in the state. On the flip side, I would add to that, you can make an argument that South Carolina, especially the low country, is the most African part of the United States mm -hmm. in terms of how some traditions, some ideas from West Africa are still very much in the low country today amongst the, the Gullah Geechee population, amongst uh, peoples of Black African descent in the state you still have an influence there in a way that may not be felt as strongly in other parts even of the South. But again, if you're thinking about Southern history and African American history, those demographics play a big role. Another example of this, Mississippi. Mississippi always having a large black population explains why it becomes one of the most virulently anti-black states in the union, which still has effects on its politics to this day, just like South Carolina. That, that is, for the class in general, myself included, what we're looking for, the takeaways that are affecting us today from that history, what's unique about that history to this place, to the people that were here in the history of South Carolina, that's affecting us today. And those are the dots that we need to connect to be able to be as effective as we can in dealing with the problems of today. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead, please. The Drayton you mentioned, mm -hmm. is, this, is that the same Drayton whose mm -hmm. family uh, went on to found the Drayton Mills Textile Company in Spartanburg? I believe it is. I'll look up the absolute truth, but I believe they just say that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that there was two times that uh, slavery was interrupted, and I one of was the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. What was the other one? Civil War. Um, and not to give away too much of that lecture, but during the Civil War, um, by 1860, there were 4 million enslaved Africans in the South. During the Civil War era, we believe that upwards of 500,000 leave slavery behind during the course of the conflict, whether through uh, violent action or just walking off the plantation. Any other questions? I think they're full, Dr. Right? 
<laughs> All right. Well, in that case, it is it is 832, as a matter of fact. Um, next week, we're going to come back and, and talk about the U.S. Constitution. I know that that's a topic that everyone looks forward to talking about and discussing. Um, but actually, in all seriousness, next week, what you're going to see is that the U.S. Constitution was heavily affected by South Carolina and its concerns about slavery. And you're going to see what that looks like um, with the writing of the Constitution and also how on a state level, the divides between the low country and the rest of the state, the divides between the plantation elite and the yeoman farmers will also create political division within the Palmetto State as well, leading up, of course, to the Civil War in 1861. All right. So again, uh, for if you have a question. I just have a statement. Go ahead, please. Um, I'm, from Williamsburg. I'm from Williamsburg County, so I'm perhaps maybe the closest to Charleston. Mm -hmm. Oh, Georgetown County, Charleston, right. because I'm from Williamsburg County. Wow, that's, that's important. That's, that's incredible. And again, that's a reminder of how so much of this class is about how our own state has such a rich history. Um, and as you'll see next week and in the weeks to come, that state history affects the nation's history, mm -hmm. and in some cases, affects the world's history as well. So until next week, don't forget, I think we have another deep dive this Sunday. There is one, Dr. Yes. Gallman is doing his uh, golden years of ancient Africa Sunday at four and it's all on Zoom and we'll send out um, another link and repeat the reading before that goes out. There's some uh, short, uh, short videos done by BBC that are very instructive, 45 minutes. Okay. All right, so we have that next Sunday and the next Monday we'll come back and discuss South Carolina and U.S. Constitution. Always a fun and fascinating topic. So until then, have a great rest of your week, and I'll see you all next Monday. Thank you, Dr.